Hey guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at Azrock's B550AM gaming motherboard. So this is not a real B550 motherboard, and the PCIe 4.0 situation on this board is a bit uh, uh is a bit weird. So if you want to know the the details on that, Steve's already done a video about the chipset and the PCIe situation on this board. But I will tell you, like, but what you should know is this is not B550. The A right here is actually part of the chipset name, um, not part of the motherboard name. So the motherboard name is M Gaming, which basically tells us MATX, and well, it's a motherboard, therefore it's for gaming. Um, what else would it be for, right? <laughs> like, no, nobody builds workstations today. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store, and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. Now, admittedly, this is a motherboard from a CyberPower pre-built, so, you know, I, I'd assume most of their customers are probably gamers, right? Like, I don't know. I don't really care that much about pre-built systems. So, anyway, um, yeah, so B550A is the actual chipset name, and it's, it's basically B450, but with PCIe 4.0 support turned on partially. Again, if you want more details, Steve's done a video about that. You can go watch that instead. Um, what we're here to talk about is the power delivery, of course. Um, and to that extent, we're looking at basically the same VRM uh, for the vCore portion. Um, as Actually, vCore and VSOC is exactly the same as what you would get um, on the ASRock X570M Pro 4, which is basically the cheapest X570M ATX motherboard you can get. Um, it's also not very good, and, uh, I mean, the, the thing is, this isn't a pre-built system, so nobody's gonna overclock this, um, but at the same time, when we look at the back of it, like, th they've also gone and just, like, cut more corners, because, like, nobody's ever gonna try to overclock this, so... Yeah, anyway, that's the V-Core section right there. Interestingly enough, it is an actual 8-phase V-Core. So the controller over here is a UP9505, which doesn't support 8 phases directly, but it does support uh, running with doublers, which is not necessarily supported with oral controllers. There are chips out there where you can't use doublers with them. But this can have doublers, so this is running in 4 plus 2. The plus 2 is, of course, for this part right here, which is our SOC VRM. Uh, the four then goes into a bunch uh, uh, into a bunch of chips on the back of the board, which would be these. Um, these are all UP nineteen sixty ones, and those are doubled drivers. So each chip contains uh, two sets of drivers, basically. So you you need a driver for each of your MOSFETs because MOSFETs take quite a bit of energy to turn on and off. So you can't just drive them with a weak little PWM signal. So you know, the PWM signal from the controller comes into your driver, and then the driver controls the two... Uh, well, it actually hits the doubler logic of the d driver, then it gets multiplied essentially into uh, two PWM signals, and that then goes into the driver, so you can switch on uh, each phase in sort of alternating fashion, and you'd have the MOSFETs at, like, up here, and then the other two would actually be here, because... The, or around somewhere in this area. Anyway, doesn't matter. Basically, each of these controls two phases and the two phases will be interleaved. Um, but there is only four phases coming off of the controller. Um, there's not much detail on how, like, if these do any current balancing themselves, but considering that this is a UP9505 voltage controller, which is a relative, like, it's a low-cost uh, controller from UPI, uh, the current balancing is probably done in the doublers instead of doing something like what, say, International Rectifier does, where they basically have controllers that are so very capable that they can actually distinguish between two phases even on a single current sense input. Um, well, a controller like the one we have here won't be able to do that, and so uh, most of UPI's uh, doublers will actually do current balancing for the controllers, because UPI generally is the sort of low-cost uh, controller option out there. Um, so what essentially that means, and, and the current balancing they implement is actually like the bare minimum current balancing you can have. So it, it basically just skips a pulse if one phase is pushing significantly more current than the other, 
the issue with uh, pulse skipping uh, current balancing is that a lot of the time if you skip a pulse for one of the phases, now your current balance is again, like instead of uh, re like going back into balanced current through both phases, which is what you want for optimal efficiency. So instead of going from like, so like imbalanced would be like having 30 amps going through one phase and 10 amps going through the other phase. And what you'd want to have is 20 amps going through each phases. That's optimal for each, uh, for efficiency. But what tends to happen if you have uh, phase skipped uh, current balancing, where it'll just skip one of the two, like it'll basically uh, skip a pulse for the phase that's pushing 30 amps. Um, what you'll instead tend to get is like, now you'll have like 25 amps flowing through the phase that was previously at 10, and the other one's now at 15. So you're still out of balance, but it's not quite as bad as it was before. And there's basically a threshold at which the, the skipping starts uh, kicking in. So, um, yeah, it's not like there are smarter ways of handling current balancing, but this this is a this is definitely an option um, that is popular with the cheaper controllers. Also on the back of the board, uh, we can see that is like who needs filtering, right? <laughs> Capacitors are very expensive. Um, so the thing is, is like realistically, nobody's going to overclock on, on this motherboard. So what you can actually see here is like, this is the same capacitor sort of footprint that you would see on like a high end X570 ASRock motherboard. And they basically just decided to remove a lot of the bypass capacitors for, because, well, if you're not overclocking, these don't really matter that much. As long as the motherboard reaches, uh, AMD's voltage regulation specifications, uh, is fine, right? Like, so this is fine. It doesn't look like, like, it looks like they didn't finish the board but no this is at stock fine i wouldn't want to overclock on this the issue with having a lot of capacitors like this missing is basically if you're overclocking you're probably going to need way more voltage than a motherboard that actually has uh, all of its bypass capacitors present because uh, these essentially soak up the switching noise from the cpu and the switching noise basically causes your voltage reg like it basically pushes your minimum voltage lower uh, I'm not actually, I, I don't know why I'm trying to explain this. Basically, this is bad for voltage regulation. That That's the simple version of this is just like your, your voltage. And it's not like this is the kind of thing that if you don't have an oscilloscope, you can't measure it. OK, so you can just forget about looking at any software and going like, oh, my motherboard has bad voltage. No, your any software voltage reading is a very uh, is very averaged like heavily averaged. So it's completely worthless for actually seeing effects of, you know, design decisions like this. So anyway, um, but yeah, this, you know, for, for a motherboard that's only ever going to run at stock, this is really not a concern. Um, anyway, so that's kind of the control scheme, right? It's just like you have a four times two, so an eight phase um, where you have one high side and then one low side in each phase. Right. And then so like this right here with this inductor, that's your phase. This up here is a phase as well. Um, and then this right here is its own phase. It does kind of look like they, they have a like the, the way they've just laid out the, the MOSFETs makes it not look like uh, like it looks makes these look like they're in a group together. But that's not actually going on. It's just to make sure that they have space for the driver over here and all of the the uh, traces that they need to run to and from the driver. Um, because this is a, I assume this motherboard is like a four, four layer PCB. So they might not really have enough, uh, real estate to, to lay it out more densely if they wanted to. Anyway, it also can kind of help with, uh, thermal density to have the VRM spaced out a bit more like this. Um, so that can improve the thermals. Now for the actual MOSFETs, um, we are looking at a SM, uh, for the high side, you're looking at an SM, uh, 4337 from Sinopower, Power, um, which is a pretty popular brand for low-end motherboards, especially from ASRock. Um, and then for the low side, we're looking at a SM4336. Uh, um, and this is horrible. Um, <laughs> so the problem I have with this MOSFET for the low side is like, uh, this is a 5.3 milliohm RDS on uh, MOSFET, which the issue with this is that the main source of power loss in your VRM um, is the switching of the high side MOSFETs and then the conduction losses of your low side MOSFETs. The conduction losses are entirely dependent on your RDS on. Um, 5.3 milliohms of RDS on is, is insane. Like it, for comparison, like, well, on really high end motherboards, you'd have like one milliohm of RDS on per phase. Um, 
which is one-fifth of this, which literally means that for any given amount of current, th that MOSFET produces about one-fifth as much heat as what this does. So, yeah, and for even more, like, even for, like, lower-cost motherboards, most boards will stop with low, like, the, the even the cheap boards, you'll be looking at, like, 4 milliohm RDS on low-side MOSFETs, and, and these are 5.3, so... These are really bad, and it's not really like Sino Power does make better MOSFET options. It's just Azrox being cheap, so they're using an SM4336 instead of something more uh, appropriate for a low side MOSFET application. Then again, this is an eight phase, so you know the current draw is spread a lot uh, across a lot of these MOSFETs in parallel. Um, and the other thing is, is just like it has a lot of surface area and nobody's going to overclock on this. So at like stock current draws, this is actually going to be relatively OK um, at uh, I wouldn't want to overclock on this. Like just no, like th this is just not a very good high side MOSFET. I mean, low side MOSFET. The high side's actually fine, but the low side MOSFET is not OK. Um, and we're not talking about any parameters for the high side MOSFET because they're complicated to explain why they're important. So that, that's why I'm just keeping them to myself. Anyway, what this selection of MOSFETs means for this VRM's efficiency is that at 1.2 volts output voltage, 300 kilohertz switching frequency, um, it is able to do and 10 volts drive voltage, which, which realistically, this being a low cost motherboard, it's going to th these MOSFETs are going to be driven with straight 12 volts, not 10, just because if you wanted to run them on 10 volts, then you'd need to uh, build a voltage regulator that converts 12 volts into 10 volts, and well, that's way more expensive than just ramming 12 volts into the MOSFETs, especially since most of MOSFETs are perfectly capable uh, with handle, like, well, most power MOSFETs are perfectly capable of handling 12 volt drive voltage, at least if you choose them for that. Um, so you wouldn't want to run these on, on uh, like, th they're not going to be running them on, on 10 volts here because that would just cost more. The one downside to running a slightly higher voltage for drive voltage is you basically get a little bit more switching loss, but compared to the conduction losses from the terrible low side MOSFETs, it's basically irrelevant. Um, th this is by far the main source of heat in a VRM, especially at higher current draws. Like the more current your VRM has to output, the more important it is that you have a low RDS on low side MOSFETs. Um, and, and well, these aren't, these are terrible. So the end result is that, but then again, this is for pre-builds. So, you know, who cares? Like, there's just, you don't, like, <laughs> like you wouldn't want to overclock on this because the voltage, like j just from the fact that they've stripped off so many capacitors behind, like for filtering the switching noise of the CPU is just like, I wouldn't want to overclock on this because the voltage regulation is probably not great. Um, and then the fact that it also gets really hot, well, that's kind of secondary. <laughs> um, anyway, so for 100 amps output, this VRM will produce about like 16 watts of heat. Um, 125 amps of output, it'll produce about 24 watts of heat. And that is roughly the limits of what you'll ever see, even like a 3950X pull on stock settings. And I'd actually be very surprised if this motherboard was used in, well, I I don't know. I don't follow pre-builds that much, uh, pre-built systems that much. So it is possible that CyberPower could decide to stick a 3950X in this. And it would work um, at stock. It would be fine. Um, I would just not want to overclock on this. So yeah, like th that's the thing is just like if you know for a fact that you know you're if the system is just designed with the full intention to like no overclocking support, then it's just like well, it's fine. You know, you can you can cut a lot of corners on your parts, uh, assuming you also make sure that then you know the the cooling system is able to keep up with the power demands of the CPU even at stock, because there are certainly some other boards where I wouldn't want to run a stock 3950X at all. So this this is this should be fine because this does actually come with a VRM heatsink. Um, so it's better than like there there are some really low cost motherboard options out there where it's just like you just have bare MOSFETs and they're left to fend for themselves, which not great, <laughs> really not great. So yeah, it could be worse, but it's already really bad. Um, there's other cost saving measures that, you know, Azrock's done on this board. Like there was a fan hitter that evidently CyberPower just decided that they're only going to build like, I don't know, three fan systems with this because you only have three fan hitters. So the fourth one was just like, oh yeah, we, we don't need this one. So we don't want to pay for it. We also don't need this M.2 slot down here. So remove that as well. Right, and there's there might be more things like that which I've I've just not noticed that they've been removed. Um, 
Oh, I forgot to talk about the SOC VRM. Well, the SOC VRM is basically more of the same MOSFETs, except now you have two high sides um, in each phase and two low sides, which is a very popular configuration for SOC VRMs because, uh, um, well, the SOC doesn't pull a lot of power, and if you don't want to put a heatsink on your MOSFETs, the easiest way to make sure that they don't overheat is to spread the heat across mo more MOSFETs. So that, that's what you're looking at here, is that's why you have four MOSFETs in each phase. Um, the SM4337s are, of course, the high sides. There's SM4336s for the low sides um, in each phase, and, you know, this is phase one, that's phase two. Um, and actually, like, the SOC VRM, like, that's technically kind of cut down well... I'm not sure if that's cut down. Like, I'd assume this row right here is almost entirely V-Core, but this row, I'm not sure what that one is. Um, so, yeah, but anyway, so, you know, nobody's going to act like this isn't an overclocking board, so you can't really be surprised that things like uh, bypass capacitors for the CPU are just missing. Um, now on the memory side, we've got the, like, I'm actually surprised they bothered with this, but I guess it's an ASRock motherboard and this is just a thing they do, um, is, uh, this right here for the power delivery. I'm not sure about the memory topology on this. It, and like, it's actually really hard to say because ASRock has now, like, I think they have some X570 motherboards with T topology and they have some X570 boards with daisy chains, which is just like, it's, and it's the high-end boards that get the daisy chains because the daisy chain actually does work better with the Ryzen 3rd gen memory controller. And I think with the low-end boards, they just kind of couldn't be bothered to switch them over to the new topology. So they just kept using the one from the X470 boards and X370 boards. So, uh, yeah, that, that's great. But with this board, I really can't tell. So I have no idea what topology they're using here. They do have some ground fills over some of the memory traces, but then you also have this part right here in the middle, which is just like, well, that, that didn't get... Like, you, you can see all the traces running through there. Um, so, yeah, I'm really not sure what's going on here topology-wise. At the same time, I would be very surprised if CyberPower bought, like wanted to ship this with memory clocked above even... like. Like, honestly, up to 3600 megahertz, the topology barely matters. Um, and I'd be surprised if CyberPower or another system integrator wanted to ship this with anything more than 3200 megahertz, if even that, right? Like, I wouldn't put it past them to ship Ryzen 3rd gen builds with uh, 2400 megahertz memory, in which case, it, like, it really doesn't matter what topology the board comes with because it's 2400 megahertz. Um, it, run it works on everything. At, in all configurations, like it's it's one of the lowest specifications for DDR4 from JDEC. So, um, yeah, that's really not a problem. So, like, it's not really a, a concern here. Anyway, for the memory power delivery, we do get the classic. I totally, I'm trying to trying very hard to be a two phase, but is actually an, a, a single phase uh, ASRock power delivery. Um, interestingly enough, on their high-end boards, they actually do tend to have two-phase memory power, whereas a lot of the other board vendors don't necessarily bother with that because it doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, but on the low-end boards, ASRock absolutely insists on having this lovely configuration right here where you have two high-side MOSFETs, two low-side MOSFETs, and then two inductors, but this controller over here, which that is an APW8720B, um, uh, and that's a single phase. Like, it, it can't run a two-phase configuration, so th this is just, like, it's a single phase. Like, I, I don't know why they bother with the second inductor. Like, honestly, because the way this is actually built is the... Uh, all of these MOSFETs are all connected to the same switch node, so basically you'll have... The, the connection copper-wise looks like this for all the MOSFETs. So you could remove this inductor and this VRM would still work. So I'm kind of surprised they bother with having two inductors because I would assume this is actually more expensive. Uh, though at the same time, let's say they were using like, like if these inductors are really low current and maybe two of these cost less than one of these. And then it kind of makes sense. Okay, doing something like this because they are using it also as an input filtering inductor over here, um, which is just like this is to just block the switching noise from the from the memory VRM from affecting other things on the motherboard that are also powered off of the five volt rail. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I, like you don't normally like other board vendors don't don't tend to do this. They they tend to use just a single inductor for their single phase memory VRM, whereas ASRock just for whatever reason they just like every board has it where it's just like well not every board but all of their low end boards are like two inductors on a single memory phase because i guess that must be lower cost than having a single inductor which 
I don't know. Maybe that actually works out with their part ordering scheme, but yeah. Anyway, um, over here, we also have some troubleshooting LEDs, which is neat. I wasn't expecting that, considering how many other things are just missing from the board. But at the same time, I guess this might be an option where, you know, the, the system, like, CyberPower actually wants it, where it's just like, it simplifies checking if the builds work, because if there's a problem with the CPU, memory, GPU, or whatever, then, you know, th this will tell you about it pretty quickly. Um, this is also nice, even if you're overclocking, just to get an idea if the system's actually doing anything, because sometimes you'll have, like, memory settings where the system needs to retrain, and wh when you see the settings that need to retrain, they'll go like, oh, it'll light up the CPU, then memory, then CPU, then memory, and it'll do that a couple times, and then eventually maybe post, or maybe not, uh, and then, you know, sometimes you'll have settings where they'll get stuck on the memory LED, and you just know immediately that it failed, and it's not even going to recover, so... I, I do appreciate, like, I, I don't like motherboards that don't have any visual indicators um, for, for what they're doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm actually surprised this is there. But at, at the same time, you know, it is very helpful to have this if you're if you're trying to troubleshoot any boot issues. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. There's not really much to talk about on this motherboard, except for the fact that there's a lot of stuff that they've kind of cut off, and it's kind of low end, and, well... It, you know, it's meant to be a, a cheap PCIe 4.0 compatible option for system integrators. So it makes sense that it's just like, well, realistically, nobody's going to overclock on that. They may never ship it with a 3950X. Though this VRM thermally should, at stock at least, this VRM should be fine with a 3950X. Because it is the same VRM that ASRock uses on their X570M Pro 4, and their X570 Pro 4, and their X570 Phantom Gaming 4, and their X570 Phantom Gaming 4 Wi-Fi. Um, so... Yeah, except on those motherboards, they actually have the full loadout of the capacitors, because people might actually try to overclock on those, whereas, uh, uh, like, I, I real, I'll be very surprised if anybody overclocks on one of these. So, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the B550 AM Gaming from, from ASRock. Um, you know, like, it could be worse, I guess. And for, for a pre-built board, like, well, the, the funny thing is, like, pre-built motherboards, you normally see relatively nice um, parts in terms of the actual like power delivery, like current handling capacity, where it's like they don't want the VRM to be ridiculous, like run really hot, because obviously if if somebody uses the system for like rendering or something and you have the VRM just roasting away, then that's bad. But one of the things that you will see missing on a lot of pre-built is just like capa un unpopulated capacitor pads where it's just like, well, do we really need this capacitor for the CPU to stay within operating specs? No, don't need it then. Um, so, you know, and that's exactly what we see on the back of the board here where it's just like, yep, we don't need all of these multi-layer ceramics. So, because, you know, nobody's going to actually overclock it. So the fact that the, the voltage when the CPU goes between different loads might you know, jump up a bit more than expected or dip a bit more than, than it should is just like, who cares? It's still within spec. It'll keep running as long as it doesn't blue screen. We don't need those capacitors. So yeah, um, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. Uh, and if you'd like to support what we do here at Gamers Nexus, there's the Gamers Nexus Patreon. You can support us directly through that. And then there's also store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick up some... Uh, uh, Gamers Nexus merch. So yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye. <laughs>